it is a pleasure for me today to host this uh, webinar with uh, Victoria on behalf of GBSB Global. I'm a professor of GBSB Global in Madrid, and I highly encourage you to come and to study with us because we are a global business school. And as Victoria said, my name is, let me see if it's working now, okay, is uh, Professor Paul Moran from GBSB Global Madrid. Um, I am Irish, as you can probably tell from my accent, and I grew up in Ireland and I studied in Ireland at Trinity College Dublin. And after my studies, I went to work in the UK, uh, in London for an investment bank called Salman Brothers. And then I moved to France to work in Paris with Price Waterhouse. And then I worked for the European Commission in Brussels on economic matters for the single market. And then I moved to Italy uh, to work as a consultant. And now I'm living in Spain, uh, working as an economics professor and a consultant for banks. And banks are very, very interested in currencies. So uh, what we're going to look at today is a brief history of uh, the international monetary system and of currencies. So we see here in 1870, uh, we see here that, I'm just going to put my laser pointer here, that in 1870, we started with the gold standard. And then after the Second World War, we moved to the Bretton Woods system. And today's system is the contemporary monetary system, which is a fiat money system. And after 2009, the financial crash, we had cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin. And then in the next few years, we're going to have central bank digital currencies. So you will be the generation for the next 10, 20 years you will be using these digital currencies. So we're going to look at this today to get a better understanding of how our monetary system works and what are the advantages and disadvantages of each system. So first we need to look at before 1870 and why did we introduce the gold standard? So before 1870, in the world, we had a few rich people, and those rich people lived in castles. This is a castle in Segovia, that is one hour from Madrid, and rich people had to live on the top of the hill in a very strong fortress to defend themselves, because before 1870, we had a lot of poor people, and this is an image of the castle from below, and you see that this castle would be very difficult to attack. So the people who were rich, the kings and queens, the nobility, the aristocracy lived in these castles and protected themselves. So at this particular time, we were in a world where the condition of man and the condition of women was one of a condition of war of everyone against everyone, according to the famous British philosopher Thomas Hobbes. So it was like, if you can imagine, the Game of Thrones and that the people always wanted to attack the kings and the queens and to take their place and to replace them. So the most important figure of this period in France was Napoleon Bonaparte, and he wanted to dominate Europe because if you have one castle, the way that you protect your wealth, the way that you protect your country is to expand and go on military expeditions. And he says, I don't want to invade you. I just want the land that touches my land. So as you know, Napoleon raged a battle and got all the way to the gates of Moscow and all the way to Spain. So in some way or other, during this period, he dominated Europe. We see here, if we look here, we see the states that were against Napoleon at the height of its power. And we see the Kingdom of Portugal that was an ally of Great Britain and Ireland. We see that Sweden and also the Russian Empire was against Napoleon. And what really mattered was when the Kingdom of Prussia 
joined all these forces to defeat Napoleon. And Napoleon was defeated in Waterloo. And this meant that Britain, which was not invaded by Napoleon, could go out and conquer the rest of the world. In this image, we see what was Europe like, particularly Germany. There was a lot of city-states, and each state has its money. All these little states had its own money, where Britain only had one money. And this one money was related to the gold standard, which meant it was fixed to the gold standard. You could change the sterling British pounds into gold at a fixed rate. While in Germany was economically backward, and therefore it could have lots and lots of monies, and it was a number of small states because Germany was not unified at, the, at this moment in time. And while the British were unified, they could go out and they could conquer the world after beating Napoleon at Waterloo. And we see all these countries that are members of the British Empire. The British currency was called sterling pounds, and this in red is the sterling area. The sterling area fixed the price of sterling to gold, and they created what was called imperial preferences. This means that India could only trade and could only use sterling as money, and they could only trade with Great Britain. If uh, Germany wanted to trade with India, it had to ask permission of Great Britain and also use sterling, their currency. So this gave the British enormous economic and business advantages at this particular time. So this period is called the classical standard and it lasts up to the First World War. So what are the advantages? The advantages are that the British, that the British Empire and the major economies adopted the gold standard. And this means that Britain was an hegemonic power. And under this power, until the First World War, we had peace throughout the world because the British Navy ensured there was peace. Countries agreed that the supply of paper money would not exceed their gold reserves. So all money was backed by gold. And this meant that there was a reduction in the limitation and the power to print paper money. So monarchs could not print as much money as they wanted. They could only print as much money as they had of gold. And the exchange rate risk was reduced to fixing the price of gold to currencies. So countries could trade without exchange rate risk. And therefore, there was an increasing transparency in costs and pricing during this period of international trade. But we all know the supply of gold is very limited. It's very difficult to find gold. And then you have to mine it and take it out of the ground. And therefore, the supply of gold was not very strong. And because if we don't have an increasing supply of money, this limits economic growth and limits economic trade. So therefore, one of the disadvantages of gold is that it's very, very limited. If we want to think academically, we can look at this paper by a professor from Berkeley, Barry Eckengreen, and Peter Thiemann from Harvard. And we, exceed, we explain, they explain to us this period and they explain all to us the disadvantages of gold. And we move to the interwar years and the disadvantages of gold was that if you have to go to war, and we see here in 1914, Britain, the largest power in the world, the biggest empire in the world, goes into World War I and they have to borrow a lot of money from the United States. And here we can see that empires fall and get into trouble when they borrow too much. And then they also went to war in the Second World War and they took on a lot of debt, okay? And because they printed money to win the war, they could no longer have this relationship 
with uh, gold. They had to print more money than they had gold and they had to borrow from the United States. And therefore, this was the breaking of the sterling link to gold. So we have this period of a change in world history where the United States become the most powerful country in the world after World War II. So if we look at this graph, we see that the US becomes the world's largest creditor, the world's largest lender. And in, in this period after the Second World War, the US is the world's largest debtor, the world's largest borrower. And we see if we look at the gold around the world, the United States has the most amount of gold, then Switzerland, France, Belgium, Argentina, India, and then coming last, it is Britain with very with gold. So we have to reorganize the monetary system and we have to organize it whereby the United States is the most powerful country in the world and they offer to have a system at Bretton Woods of fixed exchange rates. So the US dollar was fixed to gold and all the countries, France, Italy, Canada, UK, Germany and Japan, their currencies were at a fixed rate to gold. They could do this because at this stage, the United States here was in surplus. This is a fiscal surplus. This means that the United States economy was booming uh, after the Second World War and that they took in more revenues in tax than in spending. But as time proceeds and we get to the 1960s and 70s, the United States starts spending much more money than they have in taxes because of the wars in Korea and Vietnam and because in the United States, they, President Kennedy, President Johnson, President Nixon wanted to improve the health care in the United States, the roads, the airports, and they invested more money than they got in in tax revenue. Then if we look at the other balance, which we call the trade balance, in this particular period after the Second World War, the United States was exporting much more than it was importing and was becoming richer and richer and richer. But as we get to the 60s and 70s, the United States, even today, imports much more than it exports. So therefore, it is taking on debt and getting more and more weaker in terms of the financial power of the dollar. So we see here, we see the gold stock of dollar has gradually reduced over time since the Second World War. And because the United States have taken on debt, external debt, this is a liability which they owe to foreigners. And gradually we see they owe more money to foreigners than there is gold. So in 1971, President Nixon goes on television and we, he announces that he will stop redeeming dollars for gold. He breaks the link between dollars and gold. And he did this unilaterally and therefore was a shock to all the European and major economies of the world because it's basically saying that he was going to devalue the dollar. So we see here a reading from the International Monty Fund about the end of the Bretton Woods system of fixed exchange rates. Today, we're in a system of floating exchange rates that our money is not tied to any particular metal or any particular commodity. And we see that it's called fiat money and fiat money is backed, is state backed money. It's useful to pay taxes and it's useful to pay debts. And therefore you all know if you do not pay your taxes, and you do not pay your debts, you will go to jail. So this money is what we call legal tender. So if you take a dollar bill, you see that it's written here. This note is legal tender for all debts, public and private. So we see then in this period of floating currencies, which was a much better situation than the gold standard because the gold standard was a fixed system. But this system is a flexible system, a floating system. And what do we find? We find that in this period here, in the 
early 80s, the United States economy was doing very, very well, and therefore the dollar could appreciate. In the next period we see in the early 90s, Japan with companies like Sony, like Toyota, like Toshiba, were doing extremely well in the world markets and the yen increased. And then we see after the introduction of the euro, the euro in the green line here increased in value due to the European economies doing very well up to the financial crisis. And then in our period today, United States is doing very, very well because they have the leading companies in the world like Google, Amazon, Microsoft, Facebook, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So these currencies, when they're floating, are able to take account of the economic performance of all the countries. And when you perform well, your currency appreciates it. And when your currency, when your economy is not performing well, your currency depreciates. So therefore, it's able to find an equilibrium to rebalance the flows, trade flows and capital flows in the world economy. So the role of money, money has three values, that it has a store of value, therefore there's not much inflation and the currency doesn't devalue. Over time, we have a unit of account that we can break it up into small amounts. So if we want to buy a pizza, if we want to buy a coffee, therefore we can use our money in small amounts to pay for these purchases. And then above all, it's a medium of exchange. What do we mean by a medium of exchange? It means that we can use it in a number of transactions. When we look at financial markets, we see that there are transactions between central banks because all countries want to save money and keep foreign exchange reserves. And they usually nominate to keep money in the dollar in this blue line here. So if you go to the Central Bank of Russia, of China, of Britain, of Japan, you will find that they keep a lot of dollars just in case we have a crisis like a financial crisis or a coronavirus crisis. Then next, here we have the international debt market. And this market is made up of two things. Governments want to borrow money and companies want to borrow money. So in the financial markets here, most governments and most companies borrow in dollars. Then we have the international loans market, and this is when banks lend to big companies around the world. And again, this market is dominated by dollars. And then we have foreign exchange. If we think of a company like Nestle working in all countries of the world, selling coffee, pet food, water, ice cream, chocolate, milk, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, yogurt. It has to go into the foreign exchange markets every day because it receives foreign currency from all countries and to bring them home, to bring them back to Switzerland. So therefore, this is a market that is a lot of trade in foreign exchange, and this market is dominated by the dollar. And then we have the global payment system. When we want to make international payments, we have to use the IBAN, put in a special code to our bank, and know the code of the foreign bank, of the foreign bank account. And this system is called SWIFT. It enables international transfers. The United States has disagreements with a number of countries, for example, with Iran and with Cuba. And because it is in disagreement with Iran and Cuba, it will say to all the banks of the world, you cannot work with Cuba, you cannot trade in dollars with Cuba, and therefore Iran and Cuba are isolated from many factors in international trade, and the United States controls them by controlling this global payment currency system called SWIFT. Okay. Let's see how gold reacts over time and that gold is not good as a currency for everyday purchases and it is not a good investment if the economy goes well, but 
if there's a crisis in the economy, particularly a geopolitical crisis, like the possibilities of war, the rise of gold, the price of gold increases. If we go back to 1979 with the Iran hostage crisis, you can see a movie about this crisis with Ben Affleck called Argo. And people were, there was a revolution in Iran and the Iranians surrounded the American embassy and they uh, took hostage of the American diplomats. And the investors were thinking, oh my God, the United States and Iran is going to go to war. And as we've seen from previously from the British experience, when you go to war, you spend a lot of money, you get into a lot of debt, and the value of your currency is worth less. So therefore, in this situation, the investors bought gold as a safe asset, okay, and the price of gold increased. As we go on to the next geopolitical crisis, we see that Iraq invades Kuwait, but the financial markets and the price of gold doesn't react this much because the United States announced that it, in the first war against Iraq, it was going to just attack Iraq and to recuperate Kuwait. And the financial markets could see that the US army was very strong compared to the army of Saddam Hussein. And then we see the September 11 attacks. And after the September 11 attacks, Little by little, President George Bush of the United States says he's going to attack Afghanistan, he's going to attack Iraq, and therefore he's going to do a war on terrorism. And the investors see that these wars are going to be very expensive, and therefore the value of gold increases, and it increases again with the financial crisis. Okay, and therefore in times of war and financial crisis, gold becomes valuable. Then the world economy recuperates, and in normal times, we see gold reduces in value. And then we see, as we go to the coronavirus crisis, we see here the gold price rising again. And President Trump sent a drone to kill this general, Iranian general, and this also increased the tensions between US and Iran because we're very fearful of a war between US and Iran because Iran is a very strong military rival of the US. So that is the performance of gold, and you understand that gold increases in value whenever we have a crisis. So we see here the crisis here, the September 11th, the hostages, the General Sulami, and the Iraq invasion of Kuwait. And depending on the gravity of the crisis, we see the movements in the gold. Here we see that when we have a crisis, people also, they buy gold and they also buy dollars. And we can see this because people want something safe in times of crisis. So the safer asset we have is the 10-year inflation indexed treasury bond. And we can see here that in times of crisis, in the financial crisis here, we see that the value of it goes down because so many people are buying dollars from all over the world and investing in treasuries. And then we also see this with the coronavirus crisis that the value has gone to zero, but the investors are making a lot of money because of the appreciation of the US currency. So we see today the US is the economic power, and the dollar is the reserve currency for the world. And this means that the United States has a lot of advantages and senior ages when, they, when the Federal Reserve, which has the monopoly to print dollars, it costs them very little money to print a $100 bill, and then they sell that bill to all the investors in the world, and the investors in the world pay 100. So compared to any other country, because the U.S. is the most in, U.S. dollars most in one, they earn a lot more money from seniorage. Number two, the dollar is a safe asset in a financial crisis, as we've seen. When we have a financial crisis, the United States has low interest rates. 
Number three, when the United States import more than it exports, it is not that important because the United States always has low interest rates and people are willing to finance the United States. And therefore, if they import more than they export, on the current account, this is balanced with financial flows, capital flows flowing into the United States because many people around the world think the United States and the United States stock market is the best place to invest. And then all countries need dollars and this gives the United States power and they can do currency swaps or they can put dollar sanctions on countries. So this gives them geopolitical power. What do we mean by this? We see that the countries that we trust, okay, these are countries that have very low interest rates. So these are the safest countries in the world. Switzerland, Austria, Belgium, Cyprus, Estonia, Finland, France, Germany, Greece, and Ireland. All these countries are considered safe and they will always pay back their money and therefore they're also safe assets. But on the other side, we have countries which we do not trust, that they're economically not well managed, starting with, for example, Venezuela. We charge them extremely high interest rates. Also Argentina, Turkey, Zambia, Belarus, Mozambique, Bolivia, Egypt, Georgia, and Pakistan. We could add to this list and add Lebanon, okay, that has gone through a series of economic crises and currency crises, and people will only lend to Lebanon today at very, very high interest rates. So, fiat money, the major question is that can you trust your government, your central banks, and your currency? If not, you move your savings into dollars, gold, and maybe Bitcoin. So today, if you live in Argentina, if you live in Turkey, if you live in Lebanon, if you live in Venezuela, you want to move your money into dollars, gold, and Bitcoin. Why Bitcoin? What is happening with Bitcoin? When we have changes in our society of technology, changes in our, in our society due to consumer preferences, we see here that people prefer to use their credit cards or their phone. They prefer to use digital money to pay for their purchases. Okay, and we see changes in political changes, uh, like the power of the US and the power of the dollar is changing over time. Then there's opportunities for people to go into these new markets and look at the opportunities and the risks of investing in change. So we see your generation does not carry very much cash and uses very little cash and makes most payments electronically. So this is the big change we're seeing now. So in terms of Game of Thrones, there is a opportunity to dethrone the dollar. So what are we seeing? We're seeing that Bitcoin wants to overtake the US dollar in digital currency investments and in payments. And we see that Bitcoin is a currency and it is limited in supply. It is created by mining, it's difficult to mine like gold, and it is decentralized. Compared to the dollar, the dollar, there's an infinite supply. The US Federal Reserve, as we saw before, can print as much money as it wants. It is issued by a central bank and it is a centralized system, okay? And the government of the US controls this system where nobody controls the decentralized system. It's controlled by artificial intelligence and by computer programs. So here people are marketing Bitcoin as a better way to invest and to make payments. So in the Game of Thrones, due to these technological changes, we have a currency that is being created by Facebook. Initially, it was called Libra, okay? And now today, the second version of it is called DM, 
And these are private monetary payment systems. And Facebook wants to dethrone, it wants to overtake private banks and credit cards. Right now, one of the biggest banks in the world is called Citibank. And one of the biggest credit card issuers is Visa. And Facebook is creating a new digital currency to attack and to take market share and to dominate the old technology of Citibank and Visa. This is most prominently in China. Okay, we see in China that the Chinese technological companies are using WeChat Pay and Alipay, and therefore the big banks and the credit card companies are losing market share. So we have another Game of Thrones because the central banks are reacting against Bitcoin and reacting against Alipay and WeChat and Facebook's currency uh, Libra and Diem. And we see around the world the a number of countries, a large number of countries are creating central bank digital currencies to ensure that they will in the future be better currencies than Bitcoin and then companies like Alipay, WeChat and Facebook. So this new digital central bank digital currencies that will come out in 2022, there's all, already a version of this in China that has been experimenting at the Winter Games, Winter Olympic Games, and also in small countries like the Bahamas. These are the pioneers, the first countries to develop central bank currencies, and Europe and the US and Russia will also in the next few years create digital currencies, and they want to compete and they want to make sure that our monetary system is not controlled by Facebook, not controlled by WeChat, and not controlled by Alipay. So we have the battle of the currencies. Okay, here we have a summary of the type of currencies. So we see that China will be the first large economy to produce a digital renminbi, their currency. This is a central bank digital currency controlled by the government okay it's going we started in a different many different small projects in april 2020 it is for consumer purchases so you can go to the supermarket you can go online and buy goods with this digital currency in china and it is identical to the state currency the rimini and it uses blockchain which is a special technology that allows us to track all types of information and enables for us to have a decentralized system. So there's going to be a limited use of the digital remedy. So there's going to be a digital dollar, a digital euro, and you're going to have a bank account at the central bank. And on your phone, um, you're going to have an application that enables you to deposit money in the central bank and to use the currency in everyday purchases in all your purchases. Libra is, a, is the system of Facebook that wants to do the same. And like the system of Bretton Woods, it's we call it a stable coin because it is linked to other currencies like the dollar and the euro. It is issued by Facebook. Right now it's in development. It's going to be focusing on consumer purchases, especially online purchases. And we see here it's going to be pegged just like the dollar was in the Bretton Woods system to different currencies. And this system is centralized and controlled by a private company, Facebook. And Facebook would like to be the company in the future that is like a monopoly on payments, digital payments all over the world. And then we have the cryptocurrency Bitcoin. It's a decentralized network, a network of information technology computers. It has been in use since 2009, and it's mostly used for speculation. 
what does this mean? Is that as more and more people buy Bitcoin, the price of Bitcoin rises over time. And therefore, the first buyers make a lot of money. Its market is determined, its value is determined by the marketplace, by the number of buyers and sellers. So the value of Bitcoin today, if many more people buy Bitcoin rather than sell Bitcoin today, its value rises. But it will be more volatile than other currencies, especially central bank currencies. And no one is controlling Bitcoin. It's a decentralized system. So within here and in terms of blockchain technology, blockchain technology is not only going to be used for currencies in the future. For example, supermarkets and Amazon will use blockchain, whereby all the people who produce goods and services that want to sell Amazon will put up their information on a chain and everybody can track this information. So it's really a revolution and GBSB Global has a new masters in Malta about how to understand this technology and how this technology will be used in the future. So here we have the battle of the currencies. And as we look into the future, because if you can understand the digital world in the past, we used to go to bookstores and buy books. And now we buy our books on Amazon Kindle and everything is becoming digitalized. And therefore, we will see that we play games on digital consoles. We bet digitally. So the world is becoming more digital. So obviously, currencies will also be more digital in the future. Due to central bank digital currencies, which are in a battle with these ones, particularly in China against Alipay. When we look at the Alibaba group, since China started to experiment with its currency and also put new regulations on Alipay, we see that the value of the mother company Alibaba has reduced dramatically in price. So if you see, it was worth, you know, 300, and today it is worth, or in July of this year, when I got this graph, it's worth 159, nearly half its value. So we see in this battle in China that the central bank digital currency is winning against this private payment system. What are we seeing in Bitcoin? We see that Bitcoin moved very slowly at the beginning and then it started to expand in value in 2017 and in 2020 during the coronavirus crisis it got to its height of value of close to sixty thousand dollars and then the u.s said that they were going to do a digital currency and they were going to regulate bitcoin because there was a lot of fraud a lot of money laundering a lot of black money being used in uh, Bitcoin transactions, and they were going to put in regulations, and therefore the value of Bitcoin dropped dramatically and recently has been increasing. And the value of Bitcoin will depend upon the launch of a central bank digital dollar and the regulation in the US and also the regulations in China and the rest of the world. So we're going to see a new battle starting in 2022 of which currency will be used around the world. In a previous graph, I told you the dollar was dominant in all the major types of transactions in the world, but we're going to a new era of digital currencies and the Chinese digital currency in the next 10 or 20 years may become stronger than the US dollar. So I'd like to thank you for listening to my presentation on currencies and cryptocurrencies. And I will pass you now back to uh, Victoria.
So thank you, Paul. It was really interesting and thank you for such deep immersion into our financial system, monetary system and of course currency and digital currency. I'm sure that it was really helpful and useful for all the students. And uh, right now, dear participants, you are free to ask your questions in our chat box and uh, we'll try to answer all the questions related to uh, the current presentation and also our blockchain program. This is a master of science program that we run online for all the students who would like to get a deep immersion into a uh, blockchain system, into cryptocurrencies and get more information about it and of course to get a master degree. So while you're thinking about your questions, I would like to uh, talk a little bit about the advantages of um, this digital currency. So if the United States produces a digital dollar or China a digital renminbi or Russia a digital currency, what happens, it means the state has control. They know exactly how you spend your money. So for your generation, you have to think about how they're going to design this money because when you have cash in your hand you can go out tonight and nobody knows where you spend your money but in the future when you when you have no choice to use cash then the government will know exactly how and where and when you're spending your money this is very attractive for the chinese government right now and this is why they will be the first because they want to track the people through video surveillance and surveilling the internet in China and to know exactly what their citizens are doing in every moment. Okay we have a question from Nico who wants to ask what's your position of altcoins and um, are, are they just high or will they stay in the future? So first of all the value of any type of coin if we go back to the slides, what happens is, is that um, what the value of these currencies, okay, are really attractive if you're one of the first buyers. Imagine if you bought a cryptocurrency like Alcoin at the very beginning, okay, and therefore it was very, very cheap and therefore you profit. So what happens with these new coins, and they're now, there are six thousand different types of cryptocurrencies because everybody wants to create a new cryptocurrency and investors can see that if you get in at the beginning there is very little risk what is the risk for of bitcoin today if you buy today at fifty thousand dollars you're buying at a very very high price and the risk of it increasing or falling there's more risk to it in falling than increasing due to the competition, as I explained before, of the other 6,000 currencies, of the digital currencies, of Facebook trying to get into this market. So in terms of coins, it's good to buy at the beginning because they have a greater possibility to, to rise. But the real threat in the future is that these currencies don't have much value because they're not state-backed. And then we cannot use these, these uh, currencies to buy anything. <laughs> so in a sense, they're not useful. If we compare to gold, gold is, as I said, good in a crisis, but gold is used in jewelry, it is used in industry, it is used in many areas. So the big risk, Nico, about um, this question about altcoins is that uh, how will they compete in this marketplace? First with the other 6,000 cryptocurrencies and how will they um, survive um, against the new regulations? and that there's no fraud, that there's no black money, and how will they survive against digital currencies? So therefore, my conclusion, Nico, is that at this moment in time, altcoins will be high risk, high return. We have another question from Anastasia. Thank you very much, Anastasia. And 
Do you think governments can regulate uh, Bitcoin? Yes. In our societies, how are our societies? All governments has the power. And all governments don't like a decentralized system. Okay. And what we have seen is that the Bitcoin mining system is quite secure. It's very difficult to hack. But the moment you get Bitcoins and you put them in, in a type of digital wallet or you put them on an exchange, okay, like when you have cash, you put it into the bank and you have a bank account and you feel safe that no one is going to rob the bank. And if they rob the bank, uh, the bank will insure your money. But what are we seeing? The moment you try to start to use Bitcoins and to put them in a place, hackers are robbing these. And also the, the narcos who deal in drugs and money are using these. So it's only a matter of time that little by little, there is going to be stronger and stronger regulation. And this makes Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies less attractive. Um, we have um, Mahed um, Raphael, who has asked a question about Libra. And Libra, yes, has great potential because Facebook is unique in the world because so many people already have an account in Facebook. So if you think no bank has so many accounts in Spain, where I live, there are Spanish banks. In Russia, there's Russian banks and America's bank. Has, but let's say we all have Facebook. So Facebook already has a system already organized. OK, so we go on Facebook and Facebook says, do you want to buy this? And obviously we could use their money in the future to buy something. So they have tremendous advantages. But the state has said, no, we're not going to let um, Facebook become the payment system. OK, so we will see there again regulation and cryptocurrencies. Uh, even though Facebook has a fantastic opportunity to be a financial player, I don't think the state is going to allow them to control our money. OK, so that's the situation there. So look very carefully over the next months and years. Um, as we saw in my presentation, they called the, the currency Libra. Then they changed the name to DM to get around the regulations because the uh, bankers and the governments have made, uh, they said Libra, we're not going to accept. OK, will quant be part of the CDBC infrastructure? So if this is uh, Paul um, uh, has asked this question. So right now, you know, we have been doing quantitative easing. And with this technology, it's an amazing technology because during the coronavirus, where I live in Spain, the government could put money directly into your bank account. For example, the biggest industry in Spain is tourism. So all the hotels in Spain during the coronavirus closed down. So the government said, OK, don't worry. To the companies and to the employees, every month they send them money directly. OK, so it's an amazing system that we live in this digital world that when we have a crisis, you automatically get money from the government, OK, magically into your bank account. So this is the new infrastructure that all of us, the government, as I said before, knows who we are, where we live and knows our bank account. And that has the advantage that in a crisis when we cannot work, they can send us money. OK, but it has the disadvantage that they 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 have too much information about us. Let's take a stupid example. Imagine tomorrow we discover that Coca-Cola is bad for you and makes you fat. <laughs> the government in the future, in 10 years time, could, could you try to buy Coca-Cola and they stop you? It won't work. Or you try to buy a newspaper. It's banned in the system. So the government controls the system and can make sure the system that you cannot do certain things. You cannot buy drugs, you cannot buy Coca-Cola, you cannot buy certain newspapers, you can't do this. You cannot go to porn sites. 
So the government under this new system, okay, can see and automatically have much control over you. So there is advantages and disadvantages. The advantage, according to Paul's question, which I would like to answer, is there's a huge advantage that the government can send money to people, okay, um, in any crisis or if you're unemployed or if you have children in certain countries, for example, in the Netherlands, what happens is, is that children are going to go to school in, in, um, in September, and if you have two or three children, the government sends you more money to buy school books, to do things, uh, because they accept that, that, that you need money for your children, and we want to promote that families have more, have more than one child, because one of the problems of society today is there's only one child families, and therefore our population is decreasing. So we want the government to give incentive for people to have more and more children. So with this new system, there will be transfers from the government to the uh, individual families, companies in any time of crisis are to help particular policies. I have another question from, uh, uh, from Carrie. Um, thank you for your presentation. Setting aside the benefits of large governments, US and China can gain from creating their own good countries. What contrasting factors exist that would motivate countries to use decentralized currencies like crypto and whatever? So um, cryptocurrencies in terms of the government, we have the dollar in the US, we have the peseta, we have the, the euro in Europe, we have the ruble in Russia. So there's no different to us as consumers, okay, already because I pay for most of my things, okay, with my credit card or my phone. The thing is that the credit card and the phone will be related to an account at the central bank, at the government bank. So my consumer behavior will not change, okay? And it doesn't matter whether you're a big country or a small country, uh, this digital technology allows us to have digital payments. So sometimes I use PayPal uh, if I want to book a hotel, an airline, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so um, the problem is, is that for Bitcoin in the second half of your question, uh, the, the situation is that Bitcoin is not useful for payments, okay? Because um, it's very difficult to know the value of Bitcoin today, and it may move up and down, okay? Because it's not state-backed, it's very, very volatile. So if I want to order a pizza online, okay? Bitcoin was not created to, uh, uh, as unlike Libra or DLM, or digital currency to make consumer purchases. Okay, it was created as a rival to the dollar, as somewhere you would put your money to keep it safe, and therefore, and then hopefully that more and more people would put their money into Bitcoin like gold, and that value would rise. But it's more for speculation than for using it mainstream. So I don't see in the future many mainstream uses because a Bitcoin, as we saw in the graph, is worth $50,000 and it's not easy to break it up into small amounts. So if I want to buy a coffee, a pizza, okay, or a new computer, it's very difficult to buy something that is not, uh, that is not worth okay, uh, $50,000. Uh, dollars. So it's very difficult to break it down. Okay, I have another question from Anastasia. So you ask about currencies like Ripple and SEC, and um, do you think the banks will use a network blockchain and transfers for big amount of money and they can save on transfers? Yes. So I think that the banks, I work very closely with Spanish banks, Banco Santander, and they're using blockchain technology, okay, to reduce the cost of transfers. And if you see the cost of transfers, international transfers is coming down dramatically. And therefore, uh, it is a fantastic technology. It's much, it usually takes up normally three days to send an international transfer of a lot of money. 
and this is making it quicker and cheaper. So yes, uh, banks will use it, but they may not use uh, Ripple, okay? So if we look at fintech world at this moment in time, um, the new players in fintech um, have, have all gone into international payments. Um, uh, so if we think of Strike, if we think of uh, TransferWise, Revolut, uh, their real advantage is in international payments and they're taking market share away from the banks by using new technologies. Okay, I have another question uh, from uh, Rafael. Um, uh, he talks about Dogecoin and um, influencers have played a huge role in the manipulation of the value, et cetera, et cetera. So Dogecoin was set up as a joke initially as a fake currency to see if it would work, but the rules are the same. What happens is that those people who bought Dogecoin started to go onto the internet, onto Twitter, onto Instagram, telling everybody it was a good idea to buy this currency. And therefore, what happened was the value of Dogecoin increased, increased, increased. And it increased because people are very vulnerable in social media. Uh, okay. And if everyone is buying it, or everyone appears to be buying it, the rise in value, especially at the beginning, is quite strong. And you start to see that different people are making money in this particular period. You see here, so all crypto co coins are quite attractive as an investment at the very beginning. And even if they rise, as you can see here in 2013, it was worth close to zero. And then by 2017, it was worth 10,000. So all financial schemes like this is that if you can launch a product, a new cryptocurrency, and persuade a lot of people, it can move quite quickly to a lot of value where you can double your money. And people see that certain investors have doubled their money, and therefore what happens is we um, get attractive to these things uh, that are seemingly an easy way to make money. So, Victoria, can you tell us a little bit more about the blockchain program and then I will answer the next question? Yes, definitely, definitely. Thank you, Paul, and thank you all the participants for such a huge interest to this topic. And uh, we have the Master of Science in Blockchain Management program. This is a one-year master program uh, that is delivered 100% in English language as in all our programs at GBSB Global, and it is delivered completely online. So this is uh, uh, remote studies, and students don't have to come on campus even to uh, take the degree, the diploma, or uh, to pass any assignments, so everything is done online. Uh, the program itself consists of uh, several blocks, of course, is this the deep immersion to blockchain management. We are talking about uh, tokenomics, about macroeconomics, and of course, we are talking about the business aspects of finance and uh, uh, digital law, as is another important aspect of this program and of all the currencies in the world. And uh, this program is going to be really flexible for all the students. So you will have the flexible access to our online platform. And together with your classmates, all the students will have workshops, will have webinars provided by representatives of different companies and industrial speakers. And additionally, you will also have the group projects and one-to-one -one sessions with our professors. Thank you very much, Victoria. Uh, there's another question from Anastasia about the stock to flow model. So there is different versions of the stock to flow model. And in a sense that, as I was explaining, that these models work very, very well when the flow, when we have more buyers than sellers of these things. So everything is focusing on then of increasing the flow of the initial stock. As we saw with Bitcoin in the slide, it, this is very, very interesting because as we were saying, I'll go back in the slides, uh, that 
the stock of Bitcoin, if we can see it, what is the promise to anyone who has Bitcoin is that we see here that there is limited supply, okay? And this is contrasting to the dollar and to the euro and to the ruble that there is infinite supply. I was explaining under the gold standard, there was a limited supply, but the weakness of this for an economy is that uh, when we have a coronavirus crisis, we need to increase the supply of money in the economy um, uh, to handle this crisis. So this factor is very, very good if you want the economy to do well. But if you're an investor, the fear is that the more money you produce, you print, it will decrease in value. So the promise of Bitcoin is to have a limited amount of stock. And therefore, as people flow in, as more and more people flow in to buy a limited stock of Bitcoins or cryptocurrencies, therefore its value will rise. So the promise of Bitcoin is to say, we limit the supply and we will do lots of marketing, especially social media marketing, to increase the flow, to increase the number of buyers. And as the buyers increase and we have a limited stock, a limited, therefore the value of Bitcoin increases. So therefore that is the idea, okay? But as I said before, this is a good idea if you're one of the first ones to buy the initial stock at the beginning, but as the stock gets to a value, it takes more and more investors to sh move the flow of the price higher. So therefore, the more and more, we need more and more money flowing into this Bitcoin to get it to a higher price. And therefore, in terms of risks, okay, the risk is higher and higher and higher. Okay, thank you. I can see there are another couple of questions from Anastasia. So the question is related to the blockchain program. Uh, so is here the fixed... So about the fixed fixed times and about the possibility of combining it with a, a daytime job. So definitely yes, all the students uh, have flexible access to our online platform and this means that all the students can combine it not only with a part-time job but also with a full-time job. Of course we recommend everybody to pay much attention on studies and to uh, uh, to watch all the pre-recorded lectures at least for a, a couple of hours per day so on daily basis uh, but still yes it is possible to combine with full-time or part-time job and um, I have an idea for a startup uh, so could I develop it by the master program uh, definitely yes uh, because GBSB Global uh, Business School uh, also has an amazing G accelerator program itself uh, this accelerator program is pre-incubator and incubator that supports students and supports uh, the young entrepreneurs uh, with their ideas and with their startups so this program uh, will provide the mentoring support uh, will provide the financial support and will uh, guide you uh, on all the uh, tools and on all the aspects of your startup that you would like to launch but of course uh, we are choosing the best projects and the best startups of each student so do we have any other questions from our participants Yes, I think there's another question from Rafael. And um, uh, do you think we can have market manipulation related to the stock market? We clearly see has happened with GM and AMC and the Wall Street institutions. Yes, all uh, markets um, can be manipulated and, um, and you can convince people because the stock market is the easiest way of financial markets to earn money. If you think you have to work 40, 50 hours a week to earn your salary, and suddenly you can invest in the stock market, and if you can predict, and if you can persuade people to all buy the same particular financial asset, 
whether it is GameStock or AMC. And if enough people link together through social media, uh, they can do this. So obviously, with high rewards, there's always high risk. And therefore, you should only use a small amount of your savings uh, to enter into this type of risky business um, and to follow the trends in the marketplace. So, dear participants, thank you for all the questions you had. Uh, I'm sure that today was a, a really useful webinar for everyone. So once again, um, Mr. Moran, thank you for this webinar. Uh, we really enjoyed it. And uh, this webinar uh, is recorded, so this means that within the next uh, couple of days uh, we will send this information on our YouTube channel and you are free to use it. I have a suggestion from Nabil about um, the uh, sharing of the presentation and my colleagues Victoria, Zarina and Anastasia have a copy of this presentation and they can send it to you. Oh, yes, definitely Nabil, we will send the presentation. So thank you, everybody, and see you next time. Thank you very much, Victoria. It was a pleasure to work with you, and it was a pleasure to have all the participating students today, and I wish you the very best in your future academic careers.